everybody hear me okay? Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Logan Wolf. I am the Community Relations Assistant here at Bossler Library. I want to thank you all for coming out for the uh, first part of our local history series. Again, I say this is the first part. There are two other parts coming up um, in the coming months. We will have another talk in February dealing with the 1918 flu pandemic and how that affected Carlisle. And we will have a talk coming up in March about the Whiskey Rebellion and it, the role that Carlisle played in that um, historical story. So if you are interested, uh, head to our website or give us a call and we can get you registered. Tonight, you are in for a treat. Uh, we have partnered with the Cumberland County Historical Society for this series of talks. And tonight, I am happy to present David Smith. He is the secretary of the board of directors of the Cumberland County Historical Society. And he will tonight be presenting on the history of Camp Michelle. Welcome, David. Thank you, Logan. Uh, if you're wondering why in the world the screen title doesn't say Camp Michelle, it's because this talk is really on the whole history of the site. And the one consistent feature of that site is the, the stream that flows through it, which is Tom's Run. Are any of you former campers from when it was Camp Michelle? One, two, three, okay. Very, staff. Five. Very good. We want the staff. <laughs> ah, staff. Even better. Um, glad you're here, and I, I hope I give the right information as, as I'm going through all of this. The, um, the site really hosted four different iterations over the course of the 250 years. The first was a farm, uh, and that was really the longest period in its history. Then it became a CCC camp because of its association with the iron industry and what the iron industry had done to South Mountain. Uh, then it became an interrogation camp, the shortest version, in 30 months, it was a POW interrogation camp. And then from 1946 to 1972, it was the church camp. Technically, I guess there's actually a fifth stage in the history, everything after the church camp, and all the things that we have done over the years to try to, um, to bring that history alive. Uh, I was the librarian at the Historical Society um, back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And one of the questions we would occasionally get, but we, it's usually genealogy that, that people ask about. Uh, I'd say the second most frequent thing they ask it, we get questions about is the Indian school. And then the third thing was Camp Michelle. People were really interested in that site and, and how it got to be there and what happened over the years. Uh, so I went up and started exploring the area and discovered there were some ruins there that I had no idea that there was still evidence left from the time that it was particularly a CCC and a POW camp. Um, so the um, interest that we put out into the community led to a bus trip, which included a number of sites over in that part of the county, the southeastern part of the southwestern part of the county. Um, and then that led next to walking tours of, of the site. And over the years, we learned more and more and more about the site. Uh, and one of the things I discovered was there was lots of misinformation out there. So one of my goals was to try to correct that in the walking tours, uh, in a history that was written about the site, in anything that we publish about it. Uh, we try to give the accurate interpretation of what went on there. And I will mention some of that some of the misinformation as we go through. Um, so this is a map of Cumberland County back in the um, 1872. And the area we're talking about is down here. So Carlisle is here. This is what was at that time Penn Township. Half of it split off and became Cook Township. So that's the, the area where all of this occurred. And a close-up of that same slide uh, shows Pine Grove town here. 
and this is the farm. This is what becomes eventually Camp Michelle. If you've been up to the camp any time recently, there's another road that goes here right now. It's under a road that goes down to Caledonia. And then there's a new road, the show road, that goes up to the camp. This is what it looked like back in the 19th century. <coughs> and an even closer view of it on a topographical map. Here is Pine Grove, and here is the farm. And an even more zoomed in look at those, those two areas. And then just zooming in, this is from 1960, that's what the aerial view of Camp Show looked like in 1960. So this is when the church camp would have been in operation. But the history starts in 1785 with what became known as Bunker Hill Farm. Uh, three men went together and purchased this land. It had not been settled previously to that to that time and developed a farm on the site. Within nine years, the, uh, as the iron industry was growing at Pine Grove Furnace, they realized that they needed farms to support the operation. Pine Grove Furnace today is fairly isolated from um, the rest of the county, so they couldn't always be running out to uh, Carlisle or Shippensburg or Newville to get food. So they purchased five farms. So eventually five farms were owned by the iron industry. And for some reason, this one, the one farthest to the west, was called Bunker Hill Farm. We have no idea why. That's Pine Grove Furnace. That, is, that hole in the ground is Fuller Lake today. And you can see the operation was an industrial operation. And the next slide shows it after the iron industry closes, around 1895, but a brickworks developed there. So this is an oil painting done around 1901 to show what Pine Grove looked at, like at that time. And you'll see a number of features on that oil painting that are still there today. That's the headquarters of the, the office. There's a boarding house back at that time. That's the church, it's still there. This is where you go to buy ice cream. <laughs> this, of course, doesn't exist anymore. That's where the, the workers live, up on the side of the mountain. Cabins are up in this area now. And you see all this area is cleared away. This is all filled with trees down. There's the Iron Master's Mansion. There was the railroad station, which was there until 1939. And in the midst of all of this, that's where the iron was actually produced. You can see a little bit of the furnace basket sticking out. That's all that's left there now, the furnace basket. Brickworks is gone, the school is gone, this house is gone. The location of the cemetery is still there, but there are no gravestones in the cemetery any longer. If you were going to farm, the, the iron industry owned the farm, but the iron industry didn't run the farm, they leased it. And this was the, one of the leases from 1887 for a man named Swisher, who leased this farm and one other one. And the, there was an arrangement there in this lease where a certain amount of the produce would be kept by him and a certain amount would go to the iron industry. We were very fortunate um, when, I, when we developed the walking tour back in uh, 2010, and, every, and all the years since then, we have a, a, a work day every April, a Saturday in April, and we go in and refurbish the trails. And at the end of one of those work days, a man came up to me that um, I had never met. He wasn't registered to work. He just heard about it and came and dug in. Um, he came up to me afterwards and he said, I'm sure you have this uh, in your collection, but just in case, I, I wanted to share it with you. This is a 1913 postcard of the farm. We did not have it. We never had seen it before. So you have the farmhouse. The farmhouse, as we knew it, was a one-story building. 
But at this time, there was apparently a large two-story section of the farmhouse as well as the one-story section. The barn by 1913 had burned, uh, but all of the walls are still there. For any of you familiar with uh, the farm up there, now one wall is left. Even during the CCC era, there was only one wall. That has now actually fallen down. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. So that's a close-up of the farmhouse. Close-up of the barn. And then that's what those of you who went to Camp Show or have been up there before 2016 when this fell down, uh, that's what it would have looked like. For many years, the Appalachian Trail literally went right by that barn. In 2011, the Appalachian Trail decided they did not want, to the greatest extent possible, they didn't want the trail on roads. It was on Bunker Hill Road at that time. So they redeveloped uh, it up above to the north of, of the camp, and it now goes around. Uh, the only way you would know to come down to the camp was if somebody told you, hey, there's something down there you might want to look at. That was the farmhouse during the church camp era. You can see the, um, it's just really the front porch of it. And the important feature here, the reason this mark is made here, is apparently during uh, World War II, there was some work being done on the uh, supports for the porch. And one of the German prisoners wrote his name on that pillar of the of the, the porch. Uh, what he wrote was Eric John Berlin. And for many years we didn't know if that was Berlin, if uh, John was his middle name or if John was his last name and he was from Berlin. Uh, part of the research that we did a few years ago, uh, we found the, the men who were, had been transported to the, the, to the prisoner of war camp, and he was Eric John from Berlin. The next iteration of the camp comes when the farm itself closes. The iron industry closed in 1913. The land was, all 60 square miles of it, was uh, sold to the state. And the, uh, the state used some of it to begin the development of a state park. There was already an amusement park beginning there that the iron industry had begun, and particularly the, the railroad part of the iron industry used, uh, developed that as a, as a place to, to use, keep that railroad in operation, otherwise there was no reason for it to be there. Uh, but then we have the advent of the Great Depression, uh, lots of men out of work, uh, and one of the programs the, the New Deal developed was the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, which was a, a training program for young men aged 18 to 25 uh, to give to develop skills so that they would, uh, once they completed their time at the Civilian Conservation Corps camp, uh, they would have some skills to, to market when they got back on the economy. Uh, Civilian Conservation Corps camps were about conservation. So the sites selected for them were usually places that had in some way been abused. Uh, and Pine Grove was an excellent example of that. That 60 square miles that the iron industry owned, all the trees were cut down because charcoal was the fuel for the furnace. So most of the men who worked at the iron industry were not digging ore. They were cutting trees and making charcoal. They, they, they would go out in teams, they would uh, cordon off an area of about an acre, they would flatten out an area in the middle of that acre, and then they would start cutting the trees down around that acre. It took an acre of trees a day to run the furnace when it was at its height. So you can imagine from the 1760s up to the it closed in 1895. That was a lot of trees that got cut down. There was enough time there that some of the trees did regrow, but they didn't really have an operation where they would replant. It was just whatever happened to grow up. So 
former iron industry areas were frequently places where CCC camps were located. There was one, of course, here at Pine Grove. There was one at Caledonia. There was one at Big Pond. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Big Pond, but it's on the other side of South Mountain over toward Shippensburg. Uh, the, the iron, or the kind of stack for that one is still there, but it recently had a major collapse, so there's not much left of it. But at any rate, I digress. This is the, uh, the camp that was assigned to Pine Grove. It was called Pine Grove. It was not called Camp Michaud. That's a, a whole iteration that comes later. It was the first camp in Pennsylvania on state-owned land, the first CCC camp. So that's one of the significant things historically about it. The men assigned to it were in Company 329. And that was the uh, logo for the Civilian Conservation Corps camp. When the campers first came in, they came in by the railroad. It was still operating in 1933. They came in, they offloaded at that railroad station that I just showed you. They uh, set up a, a mess tent in front of the furnace stack. All those buildings were gone by that time. They set up a mess tent there. They set up their tents. Some of them stayed in railroad cars. And they lived there, and they hiked the two miles up to the campsite, the, the former farm site, to begin development of the camp up at that site. Uh, they eventually got a mess hall built. Once the mess hall was built, they moved their tents up to the camp, and this is what it looked like in 1933, 1934, until they got their barracks buildings constructed. They also built a new road up to the camp. It was called High Mountain Road. Today it's known as Michaud Road. But they put a, this sign up down at the beginning of their, um, at the end of that road to take people up who were looking for this camp uh, on that new road. This is uh, the left side of a panoramic photo. Are any, any of you familiar with panoramic photos? It was a special camera, and it, would, it had the ability to start and move and it put across, and you would get the whole panorama of a scene. Uh, when this was done with groups, um, it was not on common at all for someone who was on the left side of the photo to quickly run around and appear on the right side of the photo until the camera got to there. But this is no people in this one. Um, this was the, the, the mess hall on the left side of the camp. There were several of these gongs uh, located at the camp. Uh, they were used to announce meals, of course, but they were also the fire system. They were if they started ringing, if a fire was discovered, um, they would quickly uh, assemble. The camp had a fire engine. Uh, the church camp had a fire engine uh, that could be used if, if a fire uh, broke out. So this is the middle of that photo. And on this one you can see, This is the building that will eventually become the German mess hall. This is the commanders for the CC camp. There were two log cabins, one for the commander and another one further to the right. And then these are the barracks that were built for the CCC boys to, to live in. And then that's the right side of the camp. This is the flagpole. And this is that other log cabin that was part of the camp. Young men who signed up to be in the CCC program signed up for a six-month enlistment. Um, they lived here, pretty much stayed here, though there were, there were a few times that they were allowed to leave the site. It was run very much on a military model, uh, initially run by the Army, uh, and then eventually, for political reasons mainly, it became run by uh, run by regular uh, folks who were retired from the government. So. And that's an overview of the entire CCC camp.
Those of you former church campers, some of those buildings are ones you stayed in. This is the mess hall, greatly improved by the military later on. These are those original barracks. When this was converted to a prisoner of war camp, this barracks was torn down because they thought it was too close to the fence. And this building was converted to become the German mess hall. And this building was heavily modernized for its use by the military. It's the inside of the mess hall during the CCC period. And there's those buildings again. Um, it showed on the other panoramic photo that the, the fountain does clearly show here. That's the one surviving feature of the camp is the fountain. That is still there pretty much exactly the way it was when it was built in 1943. This makes it look like the fountain is in, in, literally <laughs> sitting next to the recreation building. It's just a matter of the perspective of this photo. It's really much farther back than that. But that building was always the recreation building, whether it was church camp, POW camp, or <coughs> the uh, uh, CCC camp. And just another view of some of those buildings. The young men uh, would get up early in the morning, have their, their breakfast in the mess hall, uh, and then they would go out on work details, whatever the uh, leaders had decided needed to be done on that particular day. There was a, a building I'll show you in a minute that was the, the site of where all of that planning took place, the forestry building. Uh, but they would plant trees, they would build roads, um, so they that would be one of the training uh, efforts that they would actually get to learn how to use road grading equipment and uh, things of that nature. At the end of the six months, if they wanted to, they could sign up again for an additional six months and they could do that three times. So they could stay a total of two, uh, two years. This is actually Michaud Road being built. And another overview, an aerial view of the camp. And there's that forestry building that I was talking about. This building is likely, the ruins of this building are likely the most important site up there. So not only was this where all the decisions were made about the work that the CCC camp was going to do, this was the place that was converted to the interrogation building during the POW era. And during the church camp era, this was called Michaud Lodge. And this is where the leaders of the camp for that particular week lived. Uh, it was often called Honeyman Lodge. Any church campers yeah. remember it? <laughs> <laughs> Honeymoon was a different lodge. Pardon me? Honeymoon was a different lodge. Oh, it was? Okay. It was for women's staff. One of the features of the CCC camps begun in 19... 34 that was sort of piloted at Pine Grove was uh, the uh, education program. They brought in seniors from what was then Shippensburg State Teachers College to do their practicum teaching these young men uh, basic skills initially but eventually more advanced uh, courses were offered and one of the things they did was publish a newspaper and it was called Bunker Hill Bunk and that's a 1936 edition. And there's some of the equipment. Uh, we learned fairly recently that uh, for some reason Camp Michaud or Camp Pine Grove Furnace uh, became a storage place for vehicles from other camps. So I think this is an example of some of that storage that was done up on the side of the mountain. That's a discharge paper for one of the local people, most of the people who went to Pine Grove for a CCC were from across the state, um, but this happened to be a man from Tola, uh, and he shared his discharge paper, and he was a, one who only stayed for the uh, one, the, the one term, the six, the six months. 
It's a, a winter uniform that we recently acquired. Uh, we don't know how it ended up in Virginia, but it, it was Company 329, so it was definitely our CCC camp. The, uh, the program was deemed fairly successful, particularly by the young men who were involved. It solved a couple of problems. Number one, they got the training. That was good. They were well fed. They had medical care, which was unheard of in the 1930s. Um, they were clothed. They, paid a they were paid a salary, $5 more than an Army private got. That caused some political issues. However, once it was pointed out that they were required to send 80% of their salary back to their family, that sort of helped calm down that issue. So they benefited their families in two ways. They, they were no longer a drain on that family, and they were providing income to that family. One of the uh, men that, that we got to interview uh, recently, and of course most of these men are, are now deceased, but uh, he commented that when you went out in the morning, uh, you had your breakfast in the mess hall, and then you were given lunch to take wherever your work site was going to be. And often the meal that you were given was a bean sandwich, a jelly sandwich, and a peanut butter sandwich. So you had three sandwiches, lots of protein. Uh, they hadn't learned to put peanut butter and jelly together yet. <laughs> for, for many years, this was the only official recognition of the history of this site. It was put up in the 90s, uh, and I've, from what I've seen of other CCC camps, I think this was a, a nationwide program to put these commemorative signs up. Um, this sign got in very bad shape a few years ago. The people from the show State Forest took it, restored it, put it back up, and now there's a little roof over it, so it protects it. So that's the CCC era. It closes, obviously, when the war begins. There's other work for young men of that age group to do. Um, so by the, the war obviously starts in, in December of 41, but February of 42, the camp is closed and it's empty. It's just sitting there, all those buildings empty. However, a new problem exists. Um, there were, as the ships, the troop ships returned from Europe or Africa, they had prisoners on them. They had to put the prisoners somewhere. So they quickly utilized closed military facilities and they utilized closed CCC camps. But, and that was the intent for, for Pine Grove Furnace CCC, was to turn it into a regular prison camp where prisoners would stay for the duration of the war. They brought in a group from Letterkenny. They totally redeveloped the camp, put up guard towers, put up fencing, two, fen two compounds. Compound one was the main compound with the those initial, those original CCC barracks in them. Uh, they converted the mess hall for the Germans, uh, or one of the barracks to the mess hall. And there was another compound two with only one building in it, and that's where the officers were to be kept. That was Geneva Convention. That's how it was supposed to be done. However, it never opened, because there was another problem. Some of these prisoners had information that was of value, and they needed to interrogate them, and the two interrogation camps that were set up were not able to handle the volume, particularly the ones here on the East Coast. The East Coast one was Fort Hunt, uh, just outside the gates of, of uh, Mount Vernon. It was a former uh, Spanish-American war fort. Uh, so they looked for an ancillary site very close to Washington, very close to a military facility, and they selected the CCC camp at Pine Grove. They had Carlisle Barracks close by, Washington wasn't that far away, so it was a logical location. So they converted that one building into the interrogation building, and it opened then in April of 1943, or May of 1943, um, as a, an interrogation center, and they began shipping folks in. This is what the camp looked like when the military was done with the, the changes. So these are three of those buildings that the 
CCC had built. This is the building converted to be a mess hall for the Germans. This is that second compound for officers, and these are the bathhouses. And the, the main uh, mess hall. They also had to build a hospital. Uh, and this was the hospital building that they built. During the church camp area, the hospital became the home of the year-round caretaker who uh, was there. Uh, at one point, there were actually two of them. One of them lived in the former farmhouse, and one of them lived here. There's the fountain with the German mess hall in the back. And another view of the overview of the camp. This particular view uh, is toward the uh, end of the camp. They, uh, in addition to those original three barracks, they built seven more. So by the time uh, the, the war in Europe comes to an end, there's room for 500 prisoners there at a time. When we started doing serious research on the history of this part of the camp, uh, we had a a non-traditional intern from Shippensburg uh, come to the Historical Society as an intern. Uh, and if any of you have been to our museum on the second floor, he was responsible for the development of the military case on the uh, one section of the museum. Uh, I took him up here at one point, and he was just absolutely fascinated. He was a retired Marine aviator, retired United Airlines pilot, and uh, he just become totally enamored with this site and the history of this site. So he, when he finished his internship, he continued to do research. Uh, he went to Fort Hunt to the people down there who were also interested in the, the history of the site and to learn what they knew about the connection between Fort Hunt and Pine Grove. He went to the National Archives Annex in Adelphi, Maryland, found the original transportation records of all of these men who were being transported to this camp. We as assume, John, his name is John Bland, um, we assume, based on our guesstimate of the buildings that were there, that probably about 1,500 German prisoners were probably processed through the camp. There were over 7,000. There were people, buses coming and going and coming and going constantly. Some of them came by rail into Carlisle, some by rail into Harrisburg, uh, some by rail as far as Hunter's Front, and then they would offload them there and, and bus them. Um, there's one story, that, and it's documented in our most recent journal, that sometimes they walked from Hunter's Run up to the camp if there was not a, a bus available. But at any rate, this is the camp uh, toward the end. And if you look very carefully, you see a fence that runs up through the middle. The camp was split in half after the war in Europe ended. And they brought in Japanese prisoners starting in August of uh, 1945. And we only could find transportation records for 140, 161 of them. So there was room for 400, because they also had to make another mess hall. So they had to take one of those barracks, make a third mess hall, and then four uh, buildings were used for housing them. If there were 400 there, we have no record to prove that is the case. This is the inside of the recreation building. That symbol in the foreground, sort of a three-pronged thing, is the symbol of the Third Army. The Third Army was in charge of running the camp, not of the interrogations. They took care of the transportation. They took care of the food. They took care of the guards. But the intelligence service, the military intelligence service, the precursor of the CIA, uh, was the one that was taking care of the interrogations. 
The job of the interrogations uh, was to determine, number one, did these potential prisoners have potential information that would help the progress of the war? Some of the earliest prisoners were U-boat prisoners from U-boats captured off the East Coast. And they knew how those submarines worked, and we were interested in learning about that. If in it, during the interrogation they discovered someone had information that was of value, they were sent back to Fort Hunt for the more serious interrogation. The main interrogation, or the main job, was like a triage center. They wanted to separate the prisoners into one of eight different groups. They first of all separated the, the military, or the army, from the navy. Then they separated the officers from the enlisted men. Then the most important separation was separating the pro-Nazis from the everyday Germans who were, or Czechs or whatever they were, they were all Germans, uh, whatever they were, uh, their, their, their home of origin was, and they weren't necessarily pro-Nazi. That was important because they needed to keep the pro-Nazis separate. If there's evidence of times where a pro-Nazi, particularly an SS, discovered that somebody, or he thought somebody was being too cooperative, that person didn't live much longer. So they had to get them separated. So the, they had all of these camps that were, uh, I think, three or four hundred camps across the country, and they were designated. So you could have a naval officer pro-Nazi camp. So all of the people who fit that designation would get sent to that camp, and then one of you for each of the others. This is the mess hall. And some of those men that's standing behind the uh, counter there were German prisoners. There were nine prisoners who were there for the duration of the war. They were selected because they had specific skills. One of them was a particularly fine oil painter. I'll point that out in a minute. Uh, one of them was particularly good with horses. They did keep horses for security purposes. Uh, there was a, a, a building where the horses were kept. Uh, Someone was a barber, so he took care of that need. Uh, so those nine were there right up until the camp closed on November 28th of 1945. There's one of the guard towers. Camp in winter. This slide very clearly shows the fencing. It was double fencing, eight foot tall. And there are places still at the camp, if you know where to look, you can see the grooves in the soil where those fences went. That's the mess hall. Again, the, the fencing on the right. The recreation building and a couple of the buildings that were barracks for the, the guards. And this is Major Lawrence Thomas. He was uh, a military police officer. He was assigned to Gettysburg to the internment camp there on the battlefield. Uh, and then he also got assigned to Pine Grove. So that there, that uh, log cabin that we looked at earlier, that was just where he lived. It's thanks to him that we have a lot of the information that we have. He really liked living in Pennsylvania. He was from Oklahoma, from the dry part of it. <laughs> so he liked the, the, the wet area. And after he retired from the military, he came back and he lived in Gettysburg. And he had a large collection of military things. And when he died, they, his daughters inherited them, the two daughters. And uh, they didn't want this stuff. So, because their memory as children coming up to the camp was that they were still in Adams County. So they gave the whole collection to the Adams County Historical Society. But they've been very good about sharing the things with us. German prisoner. There's one of the uh, senior officers standing in front of that other log cabin. And then this picture was also in the collection 
and we discovered who he is. He's Robert Chaskulek. He was from Chambersburg. He was wounded. He was sent home. He assumed he was going to be released, and he was not. He was made a military policeman, and he was not happy about it. But he was assigned to Pine Grove. He was not allowed to say that's where he was assigned. He had to say he was assigned to Carlisle Barracks, but he was actually there. He um, eventually made friends with some of the Germans and got developed a large collection of items that he traded with the Germans, insignia and patches and, and, and various things, helmets. Uh, at any rate, uh, we've tracked those things down and his daughters have shared them. We don't own them, but his daughters have brought them to the Historical Society and we've seen some of the items in that extensive collection. It's another flagpole. They couldn't use the CCC flagpole. It was right in the middle of compound one. So the, uh, they developed another flagpole which was over by the, the main mess hall. And another interior view of the mess hall during the, that period. This is one of the few photographs we have of the Japanese. Uh, those barracks on the, the, that had been built more recently on the far side of the camp were where they were housed. And this is roll call. Uh, roll call for the Germans was had, held right outside their mess hall, and roll call for the Japanese was held right outside of their mess hall. A few years ago, I was giving a talk like this to a group from the state, and after the talk, a man came up to me and said, we think we have a, a map of the camp from 1946, when it was turned over to the church camp. And sure enough, when we looked at it, it was our camp. And the amazing thing about it is it matched this oil painting that had been done. I mentioned earlier that the, one of the people kept was an orderly for Major Thomas. He was a very talented artist. Uh, he had painted this, and it matches exactly that official drawing that shows the, the camp. He also did this painting. Both of these paintings were ones that were owned by the, the daughters after he died. Adams County now owns them. Uh, he also did a study for that overview of the camp. And we do own that. Um, a man in Chambersburg, um, I forget his name, Leroy, I think the name's got on my head. Um, he collected lots of things from World War II era, many of them related to activities in the uh, Cumberland Valley relating to the war. And one of the things that he had uh, was this other painting. And that, when he died and his estate was settled, being settled, we went to the auction and bought that painting, so we now have that. It's on display in the museum. There were also a number of uh, oil paintings that had been done by other German prisoners. Some of them were painted on the walls of the barracks. Some of them were painted on easels with um, some kind of, usually a, a hard board that they painted on. Uh, and he also was able to collect a number of those, and we bought those at the auction, so we now have those in our collection. That's how he signed his painting, with the European way of doing dates. And you'll notice he didn't use P-O-W, he used P-W. And that shows on all the photographs of the German prisoners. It's as P-W on the leg of their uniforms. In 1946, when the camp was closed, for some reason, this large six-foot in diameter concrete marker was made, sort of an unofficial marker of the history of the camp. And we've been able to enhance a little bit. This is what it actually says. Third Service Command, that's the Third Army. Uh, Pine Grove, and the symbol of the Third Army in the middle. That's an eagle above the word service. P-O-W, they were, for some reason, used the O. 
uh, and then the dates April uh, uh, 43 to May of 46. The May of 46 date is wrong, so we know this is not an official marker. Uh, we think May of 46 is when the concrete was poured, but the camp closed the 28th of November 1945. So now the state is left with 50 some buildings in fairly good condition, a sophisticated camp, flush toilets, running water, sophisticated kitchens, electricity. This is a, a fairly nice facility and they had to figure out what to do with it. So they let it be known that it was available. The Boy Scouts of America applied, and two churches went together, the United, what's today the United Church of Christ, it was then the Reformed Church, and the United Presbyterians formed a coalition. And they knew they couldn't call the church camp after either one of the churches, so they had to come up with a name for it. And they decided they would use the name of the forest that it's located in. It's not located in the state park, located in the state forest, Michaud State Forest. So they borrowed that name and called their organization Camp Michaud Incorporated. From that time on, it's become known as Camp Michaud, though its more significant history actually dates back earlier than that. So this is a couple of photographs of what it looked like when the church camp took it over. When they first opened it, they had nothing. They, the bunks had all been removed, so they had to bring stuff in that they had in their various churches. They brought in crockery and cookware, and they eventually you know, supplied their own. But it was a very threadbare uh, operation at the beginning. We're not certain about this particular picture. We don't believe there was a swimming area there during the CCC era. But the swimming area that the church camp developed doesn't look like this. So something must have been there uh, in 1946 when the church camp took it over. Uh, and we, what we think happened is they enhanced the dam, they raised the dam, and made this large circular swimming area by damming up Tom's Run. Here's what the paths that cross the camp looked like during the CCC and the POW era, as is wont to happen with military, they paint the rocks that line the, the paths. Those little seedlings that were painted, painted by the CCC are now 15 feet tall. And that's that building that was located inside you know, compound two for the officers. And they put up their own sign at the entrance to the show road. And has a young lady sitting on that uh, commemorative marker. And then just some other pictures from the church camp. Church camp arriving. We, could, we continue to uh, learn more and more information about the camp. And the most recent literally happened this week. One of uh, the young men that I've worked with over the years, who's also as enamored of this site as I am, um, discovered in, that there was a church group from Baltimore, a men's group, that came to the camp and they filmed the camp while they were there. So that's now available <laughs> on YouTube. And it helps to answer some questions about how, how things were developed. converted one of the barracks buildings into a chapel. And that's what the recreation building looked like during the church camp here. If anyone knows what they're doing, I, no one's ever been able to answer that question. <laughs> There were a number of recreation fields. There was a baseball field, there was a volleyball court. Um, and 
And then Vesper Hill was uh, an important feature of the camp. It was located uh, north of the farmhouse. Uh, from campers I've talked to, the, the drill was you assembled in the camp and you walked in silence to Vesper Hill for your evening activity, worship activity. When the camp was at its full iteration, they had to develop a second one, one a second uh, Vesper Hill, one for younger campers and this one for the older campers, back over the camp from up at Vesper Hill. Some of the German paintings were hung in the mess hall or in the recreation building. When the camp closed, uh, a number of those paint paintings were stored in the uh, State Forest Forester's office, and several of them were taken by the United Church of Christ to uh, their camp, Camp Hartman, in uh, out, out, out State College. And that camp has since closed, and we just got these paintings back. Their paintings, fortunately, are framed, so they're a little more stable. From uh, Reed, Leroy Reed, that's his name, uh, when we bought from his auction, uh, were just the, the uh, cellulite wallboard that they were pulled. You actually can see the nail holes in the, in the paintings uh, where they were pulled off the wall. In 1954, the state decided that that original swimming area, which is flowing in through Tom's Run and, and back out again, that it was not safe, and so the, uh, but they, the water no longer flows into it. What had been done when the, when the site was built was that two channels were built. One channel of Tom's Run flowed around the swimming area, and one flowed into it. They tore out both of them. Blocked, well actually one's still there, but it's blocked off, the water doesn't get in it. And they developed in a whole new channel for Tom's Run to run through. So now that area looks quite different. And the former area is becoming a wetlands. This is on the west end of the camp. That's the dam that holds back the impound for the drinking water. A feature from the CCC camp is this uh, star made of white quartz decorated with blue slag from the furnace. This is the new swimming pool, what it looks like now. What you're looking there on the right side of the picture are the steps down in the control room where the fluorinating equipment and filters are located. One of the uh, recreation areas. That avenue of trees that you saw earlier. Fountain could be 1933. It looks the same as it always did. When the water from that impound area, reservoir area, at the west end of the camp um, was uh, utilized, it was piped down to a pump house near that lower dam, and then from the pump house, pumped up to a can't the right word, to this area that were tank, water tanks. So the water tanks up there where the water was stored and then it was gravity fed back down into the camp. So those are the tanks. Now the CCC, this is not actually in the camp, but if you know where to look, uh, this is the dynamite shed. It's pretty much in original condition. This is where the dynamite the road building was kept by the CCC. A few years ago, the Michoud State Forest developed a real interest in this whole site. And they brought in this machine, it's called a Royer. And they went through, it was very difficult to get through the camp. I mean, when we made the trails in 2011, you just had to cut paths through all this undergrowth. But this machine came through and got rid of all of that undergrowth. 
So much of the camp, particularly the east side of the camp, is now much more urban than it used to be. One of the uh, things that we've learned about recently is that a friend of, that I mentioned who's really interested in this site discovered that his across-the-street neighbor in Lebanon County, and that's a picture of her as a little girl, her father was a guard at Camp Pine Grove. And one of the prisoners painted that for the guard, and that's the little girl. I thought I had a picture of her. No, I don't. But at any rate, she uh, allowed us to photograph that. That's a, a box made by one of the Japanese prisoners. And that's a rocking horse um, made by one of the German prisoners. And that's one of those uh, oil paintings that we got from Camp Hartman. So other sources that, if this interests you as much as it interests me, uh, John Bland that I mentioned earlier wrote a book uh, back in 2006 on the entire history from the farm right through through the, the church camp years. It focuses on the military, but um, it's a wonderful book if you're interested in the site. And this picture on the cover is one of his general paintings. It was on the walls that got pulled off the walls. And then of course there's the walking tour book. Uh, this is available at History on High or it's also available online at the Historical Society's website. Uh, another man, Lee Schaefer, who used to be on staff at Camp Michaud has a website and he got not a partnership grant. That's a, a fairly new uh, organization that looks for ways to support conservation efforts and history efforts in the South Mountain region. Um, and with that grant, we were able to get the funding to put up numbered posts for the walking tour to develop the book. This is now its fourth edition. I'm getting ready to do the fifth edition of it. Um, we applied and received a state historical marker. Uh, and there's an application in works for the National Register. This is one of the signs that we're able to make uh, from some of that money from that grant, and that's the state historical.